my life because it was the Women for Independence rally in Truth on the 23rd of November is the reason that I could be heading south. Um, people have been asking me for two months, including Alex Neal when he was still Health Cabinet Secretary, Alex Salmon, and I'm just too ridiculous. I have a joke. Why would I want to go down there? Um, and then Jean Freeman and I spent a whole afternoon telling over 200 women we need to stand up, we need to speak out, we need to have representation. And I woke up the next morning at 6 o'clock and thought, if not me, um, and then spent 10 days having palpitations of being, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, what have I done? Um, I've now reached the point of accepting, you know, we are where we are and somebody had to do it. And to be honest, the things that have happened since have made me more convinced about how important it is. I've been a doctor for 33 years. I've looked after breast cancer patients as a surgeon, one woman at a time. And the older I get, the more I realize it's actually the basics of our society that we need to sort, or we're never going to deal with ill health. People keep talking about the catastrophe of people living a long time. Now, those of us who are of a certain age, and those of you who are older than us of a certain age, will realize the alternative to that, the catastrophe is not overwhelmingly attractive. <laughs> and sadly, I deal with it every day. And when I was at medical school, I distinctly understood that the whole point of being a doctor was to try and help people live longer. To suddenly now turn around after 32 years and tell me, you got it wrong, this is a disaster, um, is just nonsense. It's not people living longer. It's that our people don't live healthy. And it's what puts pressure on the NHS is how long you are living from when you're not well until you die. And in other places, people are fit and active. And we have a lot of people like that as well. My mom's 80. She goes to Zumba, for God's sake. I can't do Zumba. She does. Walks four miles a day, etc., etc. And in Scotland, there's lots of people like that. And certainly in True, because it's a very outdoorsy place, we have a lot of people like that. But equally, in some of our poorer communities, we have people who are ill from their, in their mid-40s or 50s. And, and that's the dream. Is people, they're not able to work, they're ill, they're having a poor quality of life, and that's where the pressure comes from. And the problem is, by the time they're at that age, you're, you're just kind of mopping up. <coughs> it goes right back to when they're children. And, and the more you do medicine, looking after people one at a time, the more that you realize that you know people are still flowing through. You're not actually getting rid of the root causes. And we spent <coughs> two years imagining how do we make Scotland a better place? And, and my view would be, you know, some of the things, I'm on the board of Commonweal, and I pointed out that the Commonweal book didn't have a chapter on health. And when they sent me the papers for the board meeting this month, you know, health was way down in a tiny bit in brackets, actually. And it shouldn't be. If you think about a crisis in your life, or at the end of life, there's only two things. One is you wish you had your health, and the other one is the people you love. You don't think about money, you don't think about how much you manage to stash in the bank to leave people behind you, how many cars you have, you know, how many letters after your name, how glorious your job was. All you think about is you wish you had your health, and you wish you had your loved ones if you've let them slip away. And what we need to be doing is actually every single policy about absolutely everything should be measured against health and well-being, health and wellness, both physical and mental. Because that's what you're actually wanting to achieve, is that people are physically healthy and that they have a good quality of life, no matter where they're born, no matter who their parents are, no matter what their postcode is. And what I have put both to common weal and we're also putting that to the First Minister, is that in actual fact, every policy we do should be cross-checked. And the way some policies are cross-checked against equality issues or disability issues to make sure that they're not falling foul of some <coughs> previous legislation is actually to say, OK, how are we going to design our town centre? Are we going to fill it full of cars? Or are we actually going to get people walking and people cycling and people having clean air to you know, how are we going to build our houses? Are we going to insulate them to the nth degree? 
Are we going to start to make them energy efficient? You know, every single decision that you would make about anything in local government, community council, national government, if you were always saying, what will this do? Will it make our people healthier and with better well-being? I think it would actually drive you towards a more ecological, a more sustainable, a more environmentally friendly way of life. And that's what we need to do. That's what we've been talking about for two years. And in actual fact, my feeling is we have to go on as if we won. Now, I know the other side are absolutely outraged that we don't seem to know that we've lost. <laughs> and hell mend them. <laughs> and let's face it, they haven't done anything to quieten it down, have they? No. You know, within an hour and a half, we have David Cameron talking about evil. We have Smith, which I read cover to cover, which was a paltry load of unconnected bits and pieces. And now we hear what they're going to give us isn't even that. And this the Scottish Secretary will have a veto. So it's like having a viceroy back. We've gone back to being a colonial uh, country where we have someone set in above our, our parliament who, who has to sign everything. It's just unbelievable. And part of what we were doing was thinking about what do we want to change. And I think that where Women for Independence fits in is you fit in at two levels because we have the big issues. We have to go down there and get better powers. We have to get a decent settlement. It isn't going to be independence. This, this election campaign is not a rerun. We're not going to have unilaterally declared independence. And I know a lot of new members of the SNP and a lot of people who woke up after the referendum are impatient and want, you know, I want independence right now. And that just isn't on offer. And it is absolutely inevitable. There's no possibility of Scotland not eventually being independent. But what we have to get right now, we need to get enough control of our society, of our economy, of how we look after our citizens, so that we can hold things together until we get that power. Now, obviously, during the referendum campaign, I spoke a lot about the NHS in England. And the reason I spoke out was because there was no media coverage here at all. I didn't start following it because of the referendum. I started following it in 2011 because when they started talking about what they were going to do, I just couldn't believe it because it just seemed absolutely madness. Because what they've done is they've broken their NHS up into little bits, little groups of GPs who sit around and decide what services they're going to buy and what services they're not going to. So we spent decades in the NHS trying to get rid of postcode prescribing, postcode services. And theirs is actually to deliberately recreate them. So you live in this area, your GPs have decided to buy you that service. You live over here, they've decided that's not what they're there for. And so they don't provide the service that you have over here. So we've instantly got rid of collaboration and cooperation and the interconnectedness that was the strength of the NHS. The next rule was that all services must be put out to tender between private companies and the NHS. And since they brought that in in April 2013, the private companies have won the majority. There is a definite push towards actually giving them the benefit of the doubt. There's a huge radiology contract went out recently, and a private company won it, even though it's going to cost seven million a year more what the NHS was saying it should be. And this is a one-way street because these private companies, say they take over a service, your hip replacement service, either they have an independent treatment centre, which are these small private hospitals that labour set up, and therefore they take the work away from your local hospital, and if you're getting your knee done or your hip done, you're not going to the local hospital, you're going to this little private hospital. Well, what do you think happens to the NHS staff standing around in your hospital who used to do your hip and knee replacement? The NHS isn't going to keep that. So they're all going to be made redundant. That service will cease to exist. The other alternative, and this happens quite a lot, is they don't have a little private hospital to take you to. So they actually take over that piece of the NHS. Still says NHS, the kind of English system. They, they don't seem to realise we have a different symbol. Um, but you'll still see the NHS symbol of England on the front door. But it's run by Virgin, Atos, Circle, G, 
G4S and all the people behind the scene. So they take over a building we built with tax money. They take over machines we bought with tax money. They take over staff we've trained with tax money. Because the private health side doesn't train anybody. They're all trained in their own thing. So we give them resources we have built up for them to make money with. In five years' time, when that franchise is up for renewal, it doesn't matter which of those models you've ended up with. The NHS service no longer exists. So when these come up for renewal, there's no NHS hip and knee service to even bid. So it's absolutely one directional track. And it will not be possible to reverse this. And this is just going on. I mean, the reason I spoke about it was our media, you'd have thought it was a blackout. They were just not mentioning it at all. And even the big UK-wide papers, you know, it'd be on their front page of their English edition, not a breath in the Scottish edition. And that was why I felt I had to stand up and, and, and speak out and get people to at least be aware of it. Well, it's still been going on. While we fought the referendum and since the referendum, it is still going on. And their long-term aim is to drive people into private insurance. This is a thing called the John Redwood Oliver Letwin come up with in the late 80s under Mrs. Thatcher. And us in the NHS, we used to keep wondering, why do we keep getting redesigned? You know, every government that comes in, <coughs> they reorganize us. We've just been reorganized. Why are we being reorganized again? And you read that, you realize it's a strategy. Because they describe step <coughs> one, outsource the cleaners. No one will even notice. Step two, labs, security. No one then get rid of the Secretary of State. Break it up into small groups that do not have power, which is where they are now. Bring in more private companies. And the final step is to drive people into insurance. Now the media are part of this down south because they are going on and on and on about how awful the NHS is. Would you trust your health to the NHS? And one of the issues I have is because they don't differentiate between the different symbols and the two different NHSs is if you read a UK paper, if you're reading The Guardian or The Telegraph or whatever it is you read, and it goes, the NHS is a disaster, people are just assuming the Scottish NHS is the same disaster. And actually it isn't. A lot of these things, accident, emergency, and so on, we're struggling, but we're not actually in the same mess that we are down south. And to run this kind of market is much more expensive. Because instead of putting all your money on looking after people, on nurses and doctors and medicine, you're actually expending about 20 to 30% on running this market. Corporation lawyers, competition lawyers, bid teams, tender processes. Actually, you're, you're just burning a whole load of the money that could actually improve the care that you were delivering. So what are they doing? They're rationing. So if you've got cataracts, you only get one done. If you have a hearing problem, you'll only get one hearing. You can pay for the other one, and it will cost you £850 to get your other cataract. And it's called self-funding. And this kind of thing is just creeping in round the edges. Like, oh, no, it's still free at the point of need. Well, no, it's not really. It's gradually being eaten away by moths. And the middle class and better off people are being told, you definitely want to have insurance. So they're all being driven and herded towards private health insurance. And before you think that that gives you, oh, well, I'll get a better service, any illness you have in one year will always be excluded from your policy the next year. So when I had patients who had breast cancer, and I had an elderly lady who was a spinster, she'd paid PPP for 40 years, and she'd hardly ever used it, and she was very pale, and she got an absolutely vicious breast cancer. And all she wanted from them was that at the end of her life, she could go into a private nursing home. In comes her policy next year. We'll cover you for everything except anything to do with breast cancer. And that's how it works. And the hospital that Andy Burnham privatized, Hinching Brooks, in 2009, Circle have just walked away from it because they're making a loss. They're not making a profit. So it's just like the East Coast Rail Line. We'll take it as long as we make a profit, but we'll just drop it at five minutes' notice because we can't be bothered, we're not making money. 
it's not there to be made of money. And people up here, obviously what we were told during the referendum campaign is don't worry your pretty little heads about it, it's devolved, it doesn't affect you. Well it does, Westminster hold our purse strings. And you have to realise we are a thorn in their flesh. They're telling their citizens, free education, social care, free prescriptions, a public NHS, it just can't be done. It cannot be done, you must accept it. And we're sitting up here north of the border doing it. And they will go on tightening the screws on our budget until we can't afford it. Doesn't mean we would want to privatise it, but until it just falls down. Our budget has gone down by 7% since 2010. It's earmarked to have gone down by 16% since 2017. <coughs> And they are still in control. And nothing, even if we got everything that was in Smith, paltry as it was, that would not change. They are able to control what we are able to do. Whereas if you're controlling your own economy, you can actually try to grow that economy. You can try and make the envelope of money bigger. You can try and make the tax returns bigger by getting more people <coughs> working actually paying them a living wage. <coughs> Boris Johnson talks about things like trickle-down economics. We can have the bit of jam that fell off the toast in London. But you know that doesn't work. It isn't trickling down. The rich are just getting richer. Well, my theory is trickle-up economics. <coughs> you actually put the money at the bottom of society where very ordinary people live. That money goes round and round and round. From the worker to the shop, from the shop, the business, from the business to the manufacturer, and then back round again, because they are shopping too. If you keep pushing it uphill to an elite, which is what the current government are doing, it either sits in a bank or it goes offshore. And we have seen the top 10% of people who treble their wealth during this crisis. And that's just ridiculous. And what it leaves is that we have more and more people at the base of our society. The base is obviously the bigger number. We actually have huge numbers of people who are barely getting by. And that's what gives us our problems. That's where the challenge comes from. It's trying to tackle poverty. And we can't tackle that unless we control our economy, equality law, employment law, so that we can make people pay a living wage. If you're working a proper week, if you've got families where both partners are working, and yet they're on benefits. It's ridiculous. That means we're paying the wages of people who work for Amazon or Starbucks or whoever it is, and they just cream even more profits. And that's what we need to change. In the NHS, we've been picking up the pieces from what happened to us in the 80s under Mrs. Thatcher. The terrible unemployment, the kind of complete despair that people went into who had no chance of getting work again or of ever getting. What's it going to be like with the food bank generation in 20 years' time? What will we be picking up from children who are eight years old, sitting in an unheated flat all winter, eating cold food and coal packs from the food bank? There's no possibility of them learning to read and write and do their homework when all they can think about is that they're cold or they're hungry or their mum can't afford to get them shoes and their feet hurt. I mean, this is Victorian. And this talking about the deserving poor and the undeserving poor, the hard workers and the scoundrels. Nobody would choose to be in that situation. And that's why we need to get control. Now, we can't get complete control. But if we go forward, if we had got a yes, we'd be having this meeting going, right, okay, what do we need to change? And it would take us all the time to get <coughs> independence in 2016. And probably even a couple of years after, by the time we'd have done the research, made the plans, looked at what we needed to change, and started to change it. And I think we just have to get on with it. And that road that we visualise going down will eventually be intersected, initially by pathetic little bits and pieces of power, which may not do an awful lot. But eventually, at some point, that will be intersected by independence. And then and I feel if we get on with digging the foundations, pouring the concrete, laying that first half a dozen row of bricks, it will also show up to the people who didn't support independence why we need it. 
sorry, we can't put the windows in because we don't have that power. We can't put a door on because we don't have that power. This is as far as we can get until we get more powers. And the thing is, we need to attack this at two levels. And this is where WIFI is very important. Because we need to educate people. Because we need to fight the political things that are happening behind our backs that are driving more and more power into this elite hand. Some of you will have heard about TTIP, which is a free trade agreement being negotiated between Europe and America. And it's to open up. There's not actual trade barriers, bar haggis. This is actually to break down informal barriers. And in particular, it's to try and allow big businesses in to public services and industries that are open. And those big companies, so big private health companies in America, would be allowed into any market for health that is a market. And NHS England is a market. And sadly, because our people voted for us to be a region and not a state, we have no voice in that. We have no seat at the negotiating table, and nor can we exempt ourselves. And no matter what they say down south, even if they nominally put in, oh, I, yeah, we can exempt the Scottish NHS. A, they won't do that because it would be political suicide south of the border. But B, these companies wouldn't accept that. They would just challenge our border as a trade barrier. There's actually one that I've just discovered relatively recently from my German sister-in-law called TISA which is trade in service, services agreement, which is like TTIP, but it's only focusing on services. And it's at a much bigger scale because it's involving the whole World Trade Organization. And it is deliberately aimed at opening up public services and not allowing government monopolies on the delivery of things like education and health. And that's been being negotiated for two years. And we know nothing about it. So there is this absolute drive, not just to the wealthy, but driving things into the hands of, in the end, what might be 100 companies worldwide. Because things that the Scottish government wanted to do, like in infrastructure projects, allowing more Scottish companies to gain from when we build something or when we give a contract, they wouldn't be allowed to do that. They must throw it out. And therefore, if some American company or European company can come in and undercut them, they are not allowed to give any favoritism to local companies at all. That means they can come in and use their methods to employ at the local lo poorest level, to pay at the poorest level, and to suck all the profits back out to wherever that company comes from. And they will just gradually coalesce until literally we have this handful of huge multinationals that are bigger than any government. <coughs> and can buy and sell us before lunchtime. And we need to wake up to that. And where WIFI comes in is this kind of thing. We need to be educating. We need to be keeping people awake. And we need to be keeping them active. So some of it is running meetings, trying to bring your friends, trying to get people talking. And the other thing is going back to that, building the better Scotland. And I always saw it as coming from both ends, that we fight politically, try and get representation politically, we try and change the big structures. But we also have to knit it from the bottom up. So you need to be thinking about, well, this is where we live. What would we change? What is wrong in Stirling or in your area? What are the projects that you could get involved with? And then you need to make a lot of noise. And what you'll find in some of the other groups, it's not just the people who are independent supporting that will join you might not join Women for Independence, but they may join you in a project you do. So the East Ayrshire group, they were collecting clothing and toiletries and things for one of the women's aid centres in Ayrshire. And suddenly they had people who were actually labour supporters and other official groups going, oh well, we'll have a collection and we'll give it to you. And it didn't seem to bother them at all that Women for Independence so you want to become a brand in the sense of educating people, but also a group that can be seen to be changing your own society, your own community. Because that's what we've got to do. That's what we wanted. We didn't want to sail off into the sunset. We didn't want to put up a fence. You know, We weren't planning to become anti-English or anything else. We just wanted to improve our own societies, our 
own views and our own thoughts. And that's what I think that you need to take on. So raising awareness so that we can fight this elite that are working on a world level behind our back, but also improving the fabric of Scottish society. Because that's the only way that we're going to build the Scotland we've spent two years imagining, and that is going to be the Scotland for our children and their children.